So tonight we are going to do Ruth, and as I have been saying to folks for a week or so, I ran, ran into a rabbinic website called alephbeta.org, which is the name of Aleph Beta Academy. There are several rabbis that teach there, but one of them is a guy named David Foreman. He was doing the Joseph story talking about Judah in the Joseph story. And he gave me an insight into Ruth that I thought was really cool. So I'm going to take you through that. The question is, what do you do when there's no heir? Typically, you have a male who's married, and for one reason or another, there are no children and no heirs. So the question is, what do you do about it? And there are three stories in the Bible that deal with that question. The term for that, obviously, for those who've been around, is Leverite marriage. And in Hebrew, it's Ibum. I will probably be calling it Ibum because that's what Foreman did when I was listening to him. And so that's sort of what's welded into my head. So uh, just recognize that when I talk about Ibum, I'm talking about Leverite marriage. So the first story is Lot and Sodom. You all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that Sodom and Gomorrah were so evil that God heard it all the way up to heaven and he came down to check out to see if things were true. Abraham negotiates with him and prevails upon him that if he can find ten righteous men in the city that it won't be destroyed. And of course, that doesn't work out so well. So the angels that are sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah grab Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, and drags him, his wife, and his two daughters out of there, leaving his sons-in-law. Depending on what translation you read, it's either his sons-in-law who were betrothed to the daughters who go out. In other words, they had not yet married. Or it could just be other children of Lot who are sons-in-law, whether he had more than two daughters or just two. It, 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 and again, if you read the Tanakh, it's... Uh, future sons-in-law, if you read, I think, English Standard, it's just sons-in-law, so at least in translation, it's ambiguous. At the end of that, what we have is Lot's home, all of his wealth, and his sons-in-law are all destroyed. Okay, remember, Lot was a very wealthy man. In fact, so wealthy that he and Abraham couldn't be in the same zip code because their flocks conflicted with each other. So Lot was given first choice, and he took the cities of the plain, the Jericho Valley, leaving Abraham the ridge. And of course, we know what happened. But at this point, Lot doesn't have any more of his stuff. All of that got destroyed in the conflagration of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot has no heir. And Lot's daughters have no prospects. Because, remember, Lot was a very wealthy man, and they would have been very attractive catches before this unfortunate incident with Sodom. After the unfortunate incident with Sodom, they are reduced to living in a cave, hiding out. So his daughters got no prospects of marrying. Lot has no heirs. The daughters decide to carry on the family line. Again, the way the text reads is they say to one another that basically we are the last three people on earth and it's up to us to propagate the race. I don't think that's what it's actually meant because you remember when Lot flees from Sodom, he stops off at Zoar. That's where he camps out while fire and brimstone rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah. So there is at least one other small town full of people so it is in fact not the case that his daughters reasonably could assume that there isn't anybody else in the world. So I am taking it to mean Lot's line dies out if we don't do something. I understand that's not what the text says, but having said that, I think that's what's actually going through their minds. So from there we get Moab and ben -Ami. The next incident is Judah and Tamar. And we just finished 
that a few weeks ago in Midrash. Judah marries a Canaanite woman named Shua, and he has three sons by her. The eldest, Ur, marries this lady named Tamar, and he dies for his sins. Don't know what those sins were, but they were of such a nature that God whacked him. So, Judah gives Onan, the second son, to Tamar, and tells him to perform Ibum with her and get a replacement for Ur, or a descendant for Ur. That, those are the specific instructions that Onan is given. And of course, we all know that Onan refuses to do that. You know, he doesn't have any problem fooling around with her, but he is not going to impregnate her. And that just sort of annoys God, and Onan gets taken out. You need to understand that Judah doesn't know any of this necessarily. The only thing Judah knows for sure is this gal Tamar seems to be bad luck. So what he does is he withholds his third son, Shelah. The initial excuse that he gives for withholding Shelah is just isn't old enough yet. We're going to have to wait around a few years until this guy gets old enough to get married. Well, in fact, it also says that he was a bit nervous about giving his last son to this lady who had at least in his eyes, been the death of his first two. So having lost two sons, he isn't willing to risk a third. Tamar, at least in her mind, is owed a child. She has a right to expect that she be given the third son, and when she's not, she decides to take matters into her own hands, and she seduces Judah. And you all know the story, you know, he's going up to do some sheep shearing and she uh, poses as a prostitute beside the road and, and long negotiation, all of which is really an interesting study all by itself, but I'm going to sort of skip over that. The, the, the upshot of it is that she becomes pregnant and when Judah finds out, he condemns her to die. So, Judah has a problem that he doesn't know about. We know about it because we've read the rest of the Bible. If Judah doesn't succeed in figuring out how to avoid Tamar's death, he basically will lose the line of the kingship of Israel. There will be no David, there will be no Yeshua. So Judah has got quite a bit riding on his decision as to what he's going to do with Tamar, who has shown up pregnant, under what he regards as suspicious circumstances. He does solve his problem, and the way he solves his problem is by accepting responsibility. Because he accepts responsibility, what he does is he demonstrates the character that you want in a king. In other words, a king makes mistakes, everybody does, and the question is, when you make a mistake, what are you going to do about it? And in Judah's case, he shows here with Tamar, and he will show again with Joseph, that he is able, when he is confronted with a mistake that he has made, he's able to stand up and say, I did it. I'm responsible, and I will do what I can to make it right. So he is the one who is able to show repentance and so forth. And notice that at the end of that, he regains his two lost sons. You notice I've got the regains in quotation marks. Because Tamar comes up with twins. He's lost two sons. He now has two sons again. So let's look at these two stories side by side, and let's look at the similarities. And for those of you who want the reference, there's the website that this Rabbi David Foreman holds sway at. And as I have said up front, and I will continue to say, this whole introduction was given to me by some ideas of his, some of mine. I may make mistakes and he wouldn't own up to, and if I do, those are mine, but that's where I got the ideas. So let's look at the position in the text. What you've got is 
the first half of Genesis is the story of Abraham. The second half of Genesis is the story of Joseph. In both cases, you have the story of the main character interrupted by a single chapter vignette. In the Abraham story, it goes on starting in Genesis 12 through 18, and then all of a sudden you got this break and you got the story of Lot and Sodom. And then we pick back up with Abraham in chapter 20 and go on to 24. The similarities then are you have, as you say, the main story, which is the story of Abraham or the story of Joseph. It goes along for some length of time, and then it's interrupted by a single chapter, vignette, and then the story picks up again. So the, the structure is the same. So the first one then is position in the text. The next similarity is both stories focus on a relative of the main character. So Abraham is the main character. His nephew is Lot. Joseph is the main character. His brother is Judah. And in fact, you could say that character in the vignette is, in a sense, a brother of the main character. In other words, Lot is the son of Abraham's brother. So it's a generation down, whereas Judah is a full brother. But again, the idea here is that it's brothers that we're dealing with. They're both seduction stories. And in both cases, the women initiate it. In both cases, the women deploy deception because they don't think that in the broad daylight, the men would go along with it. In the case of Lot's daughters, they get Lot drunk because they don't expect that Lot is going to just sort of, on a Shabbat afternoon, cohabit with them and get them pregnant. They have to trick him. Similarly, Tamar has to disguise herself as a prostitute and trick Judah that way. Judah doesn't know who she is because if he did, he wouldn't do it. Women's motives in both cases are to ensure that the family line doesn't die out. The men's motives in both cases are somewhat less pure. And then finally, out of both of these, you have two sons. So here's a list of how those two stories are similar. And I, I think it's very profound. Foreman doesn't go over the story of Lot and Sodom. The Midrash that I was going through was with Judah and Tamar. And he goes into extreme detail to show why it has to be there. One of the things that he talks about, just as a side, everybody know what the Wellhausen hypothesis is? Basically, Wellhausen was a German in the 19th century. And he came up with the thought that, wait a minute, the Torah was not written by one person. It was cobbled together out of stories that were floating around and somebody tacked them together with hot glue. And what Foreman does in great detail from the Hebrew is demonstrate that not only is the Joseph story with the inclusion of Judah not cobbled together, it is extremely integral to the entire story and Everything in there points backwards and forward linguistically, and it just flat says, well, housing is not right. The idea that you have these two stories that are identical in so many ways, I will gently suggest is not a coincidence. This will now make it all clear. What you have is the Abraham story interrupted by Lot and Sodom, out of which you get Moab. And you have the Joseph story interrupted by Judah and Tamar, out of which you get Perez. Ruth is a descendant of Moab. Boaz is a descendant of Perez. And Ruth and Boaz come together in a story about Yibum, or Leverite marriage, which is the book of Ruth. What the book of Ruth does is it takes the loose ends, if you will, you know, all of the things that in the Lot story and in the Judah story that everybody says, what? And it brings not only the protagonists together, but it tells the story again, what I would say, correctly. At a minimum with pure motives. 
But again, notice that Lot in Sodom is sort of a story of Yaboom, but not right. It's almost a story of a Leverite marriage with Lot and Sodom, but not quite because you have incest involved and a bunch of other stuff. Similarly, with Judah and Tamar, it's almost a story of Yaboom, but again, not quite, because you've got the father-in-law is the sire to the two children instead of his third son, Shelah. So both of these are flawed stories, if you will. And yet, in the book of Ruth, what the Bible does is it takes these two stories and the children that come out of those two stories and puts them together and gives you a complete and correct story of Leverite marriage. Rabbi Foreman, at least in Judah and Tamar, demonstrates very convincingly how this is not something that is just sort of stapled into the Genesis narrative. And what I'm suggesting to you as you look at this bigger picture here, it's very clear that neither Lot in Sodom nor Judah and Tamar is simply something that's stapled into the biblical narrative. It is, in fact, an integral part of the story which is giving background, which is then going to be fleshed out and completed in the book of Ruth. And that's the question Foreman is asking, too, as, as he goes through uh, Judah and Tamar. Is it, why is this here? Where did it come from? This is one of his insights. There, there are lots more really good insights simply about Judah and Tamar and its relation to the story of Joseph that doesn't have anything to do with Lot and Sodom. So it's a really good study. So I'm going to now go off slides, and I'm going to go to the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah, who went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife had two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi. The names of his two sons were Mahalon and Chilion. Elimelech is, my God is king. Naomi means my delight. Mahalon means sick, as in ill or puny. And Chilion means pining, as you are pining or wasting away. So the, the two boys, you can tell from their name, aren't long for this world. And then Ruth means friendship. And Boaz means quickness, by the way, when we get down to him. So two and a half. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Mahalon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. All the guys in the story at this point are dead, and we are left with three ladies, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband." Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. So at this point, what she's saying is, there's no future with me. You are both still young women. Your best prospects of marriage and children and a family lie in your own land. I'm not going to stay here. I'm going back home. But it's best if you two stay where you are, because your prospects will be better there. Verse 10. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? She's thinking in terms of Yaboom or Leverite marriage. In other words, I am the last link to both Elimelech and 
Mahalon, and Chilion. So your only chance of a Leverite marriage would be for me to have sons. And first off, I am too old. But even if I weren't too old, by the time I had them, and they were then old enough to be married to you, you probably wouldn't be old enough to have children. So she's saying, basically, we're done. Verse 12. Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So at this point, Orpah has recognized the handwriting on the wall, realized that Naomi has given her good advice, and she's going back home, back to her father's house, where she has an opportunity then to remarry. Ruth, however, does not. And she, Naomi, said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. When I die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. A couple of things here. For anybody who has been involved in poetry or music, that speech of Ruth's has been set to poetry and music forever. It's regarded as one of the finest expressions of love in any language. The other thing is how many times does Naomi tell her daughters-in-law to go back? Three times. And it is my understanding, I've never tried to do this, but it's my understanding that if you go to a rabbi and ask to convert to Judaism, they will tell you no three times. If after being told no three times, you still insist, then they will take you on as a convert. And that comes from this passage of Scripture. Verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And Mara, of course, means bitterness. We saw that for the first time. Anybody know where we saw that for the first time, by the way? Exodus, the springs of Mara. When they come out of Egypt, they come to the springs of Mara, which are bitter. And there, Moses throws a piece of wood in, and the springs turn sweet. 21. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So they are coming there at Passover. The barley harvest is specifically the thing that signals that Passover is there. You all know the, the story of Abib barley during the month of Adar, which is the month before Nisan, the first month, they go out and they look for ripe barley. And if they find ripe barley, the next new moon then becomes Nisan. The first Sunday after the first Shabbat, after Passover, becomes the first fruits when they bring the first fruits of the barley harvest into the temple. If they don't find any barley, then they stick an extra month into the calendar to give the barley time to ripen. So the fact that they are harvesting barley at this point indicates that we are in the spring in Passover. Chapter 2. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And again, Boaz means quickness. 
And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. Again, you all know the Torah. And the Torah says that when you harvest, you will allow the poor to glean in your fields, which indicates that the two of them, both widows, are poor. And so they go out, she goes out, she being the younger of the two, she goes out with the intention of gleaning after the harvesters. And she said to her, Naomi Naomi says to Ruth, and she said to her, go my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the clan of Elimelech. Now, this says it happened to, the rabbis say that coincidence is not a kosher word. So given the structure of everything else that's happened, you know, we just saw in Genesis and so forth, I will gently suggest that this is no coincidence. She is being directed as a daughter of Moab to Boaz's field, who is a son of Perez. As I said, I don't think there's any coincidence here. She thinks it's a coincidence. Boaz thinks it's a coincidence. I don't. Verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, Yehovah be with you. And they answered, Yehovah bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Understand that the Torah command is to allow the poor to glean the fields. The problem with that is lots of times gleaning the fields can turn into theft. In other words, you know, you go buy a stalk of grain and you pull out a handful from the shock that's been put up. And so what appears to be the case from this story is that the ones who are doing the reaping tend to harass the gleaners. Because the gleaners, if left to their own devices, will be right up there with the reapers, not getting the leftovers, but getting the prime stuff. That's just human nature. Nothing sinister about that one way or the other. God says you got to let them glean, and the attitude of the reapers would be, glean is not up here around us among the sheaves that we've just finished shocking up. Gleaning is back over there at that end of the field where there's no grain and nothing that can be stolen. The other part of this is Boaz, as we're going to find out, is an older man, no spring chicken, and he's got an eye for the ladies because he sees Ruth and says, huh, who's that? And the report that comes back is that she is diligent. She has been working steadily all day, and has taken a minor break, but is basically an industrious young woman. That's the report that he gets. Verse 8, Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young man not to touch you? By him giving that charge, there's an indication that that charge is necessary. In other words, if you've got to tell the field hands, don't harass this gal, then there is reason to believe that they might. I, I don't necessarily mean in a sexual way. I simply mean as you're up too close to us, you're too close to the good stuff, back off. That kind of thing. So let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. He's saying you get to work among my women who are working in the field. Feel free to drink the water we've drawn. We are not treating you like a complete outsider. You are closer to being someone in my household. And of course, She is related. 
Verse 10. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Not only am I poor and gleaning, I am also not an Israelite. There's lots and lots of reasons for you to harass me, run me off, let the the reapers keep me at a distance and all that. Why are you doing this for me? Verse 11, Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What is this that she has done that Boaz is so impressed with? Naomi's not out there gleaning. Naomi is an older woman. So for Naomi to have a strong, healthy young woman who is willing to go out and glean and do work and all that kind of stuff to maintain her is a valuable thing. So not only has Ruth given up her prospects of an immediate husband back in Moab, she has in effect become the helper or servant of Naomi. She's not a servant. She's, she's family. She's the one that can go out and glean while Naomi is perhaps not up to working all day in the field. That's the kindness that Boaz is talking about here. As I say, not just that you decided to ditch Moab and come to Israel. It's more than that. You have treated your mother-in-law with kindness and respect, and you are supporting your mother-in-law, and that's a good thing. Let me read 12 again. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward given to you by by Yehovah, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So remember back in the little speech she made, you know, your God will be my God. So she has moved out away from the Moabite gods and has come to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, Moabites are descendants of Lot, so Moabites very well may worship Yehovah also. Or they may be idolaters. just don't know. Verse 13. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, eat some bread, dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and she passed her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. The idea that her being wandering around among the stacked sheaves would be a cause for suspicion on the part of the reapers, what Boaz is saying to them is, you let her do that. I understand that some of the stuff you have reaped, she is going to wind up with, and that's the way I want it. Verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And an ephah is three-fifths of a bushel. So she's got quite a bit of barley there. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, So she brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. So she brought the remainder of her lunch back to her mother-in-law, also bringing back all the grain. Notice the other part of this that's talking about her character. At the end of the day, she stops and she beats out the grain that she has. In other words, she continues to work until her work results in something that is going to be useful. 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by Jehovah, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Again, you, you all know from the Torah, that if somebody falls on bad times and has to sell himself or his land, a near kinsman can go in and pay that debt and redeem the land. 
So the fact that he is a redeemer indicates that he is one who is eligible to redeem the fields belonged to Elamelech, because Elamelech apparently mortgaged his fields when he went to Moab. But you all, of course, know that land in Israel is not sold, it's only leased. It belongs to God. So at the Jubilee, the land goes back to its original owner, which would be Elamelech, or his descendants. Before the year of release, a kinsman redeemer can go to the one who has purchased the field and has the right to buy it back from the purchaser by basically paying the equivalent of the number of crops remaining until the Jubilee. 21. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young men, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So she got there at Passover. She continues to glean through the barley harvest. Then at Shavuot is the wheat harvest, and she gleans through the wheat harvest as well. So chapter 3 is then going to be at least a year later. Would somebody like to close in prayer?